and I am Professor Dan Krause, and Allison, uh, I should say Professor Harris, came to me at one point, said the Psych Club was interested in having someone talk about sports psychology, and I thought, hmm, sounds familiar. And I used to have a student of some sort, and she's off getting um, her degree in counseling psychology with an emphasis in sports psychology. I wonder if she'd be willing to come back to CNC. And luckily she is. So Shelly Scheidman was in my lab as a freshman. Mm -hmm. She took intro to psychology with me. Yep. So people survive it and go on to great things afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and she worked in my lab for a year. She got to present at APA, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and she went on to do her senior thesis on um, <laughs> childhood obesity. Childhood obesity. Reducing, reducing weight stigma. Which she got published. Yeah. She worked with Professor Brown on it uh, as a two semester honors empirical thesis. And she got it published in a, in a major journal. Um, and then she went on to graduate school at University of North Texas. As I said before, in counseling psychology, she's in her fourth year now. Yep, not uh, to finish. Not to finish. <laughs> she's about to uh, propose her dissertation, which is a big moment. Uh, but she's done lots of interesting things while she's been there. So she's worked with the tennis team, the women's tennis team. She's worked with the track and field team for a year. Um, and when she was here, she was a standout lacrosse player. <laughs> um, so um, back when scenes. CMS was very proud of its lacrosse team. Things have changed a little bit over the years, but it used to be one of our preeminent uh, women's sports. So I am overjoyed to actually have one of my students be successful, so you people have some <laughs> rationale for trusting me. Good things can happen. And I am just happy to introduce her to come speak with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. <laughs> well, uh, you took my, my introductions. There we go. <laughs> So, I'll just jump right in, uh, and if someone can maybe tell me if I'm getting closer to time, normally I would look at a clock, but I don't, okay, it's over there. Um, so, if someone wanted to give me like a five minute for when we want to get to questions and answers, that would be great. But, yeah, so today I'm going to be covering kind of four different objectives. Uh, the first is I'm going to give you a broad introduction to what sports psychology is. Uh, then I'm going to talk about my personal experience working in D1 athletics for the last four years as a sport consultant. And then I'm going to talk about different training models. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved in sports psychology, what are the different paths you can take to get there? And then last but not least, what type of jobs you can get as a sports psychologist, because that's pretty important as well. <coughs> so, let's go ahead. Okay, so what is sports psychology? Uh, sports psychology is a multidisciplinary uh, field in which you are combining psychology, sports science, and sport medicine. It is often a focus that you have uh, after you're in a doctoral degree program that is either in counseling or clinical, because then you're trained in working with mental health, and so then you specialize in sports psychology at that time. And I'll talk more about kind of the training models you can go through, because you can go through not just psychology, but also kinesiology and sports science as well. So yeah, so that's kind of a broad introduction to how you define sports psychology. In terms of who we serve, so we serve a variety of athletes. Now how you define athlete, we can you know, debate <coughs> in a sense, and so it can range from recreational athletes, those who enjoy just being physically active, identify with athletic identity, to those who are kind of novice, getting involved in sports at a young age, so youth, uh, to more intermediate and the expert level where you really get to college athletes at the D1, D2, D3 level, uh, professional athletes, Olympic athletes. So those are maybe some of the ones that come to mind initially when you think of, okay, who would a sports psychologist serve? Uh, some other areas that are really important um, that also very valuable is coaches and parents. Uh, now parents, particularly in youth sports, they initially present this opportunity for youth to get involved in sports. Uh, different sports require usually different financial commitments, time commitments, rides, and so parents get, are, play a crucial role in getting their kids involved, getting them active. But it can very quickly evolve to being something more than just positive. It can evolve to being pressured to need to get a scholarship in order to do well in school or to be able to qualify to get to universities. Uh, which can then, at a very young age, have a negative impact on youth. Um, you see nowadays 
with many youth, uh, they have different kind of elbow surgeries and things that are were typically only happening at the professional levels in baseball that is now happening with 12 and 13 year old kids. And so this is a really big area that, that does need attention in the field of sports psychology so that we can make sure that parents are having, continuing to have a positive influence on kids and being physically active and healthy rather than also kind of too much pressure or too much stress on them at a young age where they're feeling like their sport becomes a job. Uh, and then the other area is really um, thinking about coaches. So coaches are going to be the biggest advocates of sports psychology because often, so I can come in, I'm assigned to work with a team, the coach is all on board, I'll be working with them, helping them kind of mentally, psychologically prepare, increase their performance, but who are they gonna see every day? Who do they trust and they depend on? Who is going to be traveling with them to every week? It's their coach. So working with, I've done a lot of training with coaches in the area of sports psychology because they can be the biggest advocates. They're the ones who can really have this um, long-term impact. So teaching coaches how to help them build different mental skills that I'll go over kind of later on in this presentation can be very valuable. Uh, and also having a coach who's open to that. Uh, you often kind of, um, in D1 athletics and across all, all, all different levels, you have some coaches who are gonna be open to learning more about different techniques and those also who really want to stick to their traditional model, stick with what they know that works. So you have to be able to work within the field of sport and know the culture, know where you can and can't have access. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of a summary. And um, I actually, actually saw um, Sonia Richards Ross, she's one of the fastest women uh, in the world in the 2012 Olympics. She won the 400 uh, meter as well as the four by four. Uh, and I met her last weekend. Um, so she, uh, she actually was at a, I traveled with the track and field team, and uh, she was at uh, Baylor University at uh, a meet that they were having, and she actually ran with the men in the 4x4. Four four. So thinking about a distraction, you are racing with one of the fastest women in the world. And uh, so that was pretty interesting, talking to several of the athletes after kind of how they managed that, and, whether that impacts their performance in terms of enhancing it or potentially actually kind of uh, being intimidating in a sense. So, but I decided I wanted to include her picture and she looks just like that. She's, she's really awesome. So, uh, so that was really great. Okay. Woo! <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, great the presentation, Dr. Krauss. So, uh, so moving on, so what do we do? Uh, so, I listed up here some of the presenting reasons why maybe an athlete um, may come and seek sports psychology uh, services. These are just uh, an initial list. I also listed tools on the left of what we teach them to help them develop um, more of these psychological states. So just know that this isn't exhaustive, but I'll go over a few of them so you can kind of get introduced to them. So often some of the most uh, common presenting kind of concerns is, okay, I'm really anxious right before um, my game or my competition, or I'm not able to keep my focus. I feel like I'm, I'm losing my focus. I, I'll, I'll be in the middle of a tennis match and I'm not really focusing on what's happening. I'm thinking about the next three points ahead. Uh, or I feel um, like I, I don't really know what my purpose is, or if I'm still motivated to do my sport, I'm feeling like I, I might be burned out. I, I work out, wake up, do two-a-day practices, and I'm struggling to get through school, and I'm really just feeling absolutely exhausted uh, and burned out. And so there's a lot of different, um, or I just want to improve my performance. Uh, I'm doing really well. I've reached this kind of plateau in my performance over the last like two years, and I really want to just get to that higher level. Uh, and so all of those uh, really common things to be brought to a sports psychologist that we have lots of things to teach you. Uh, so um, to go over a few things, uh, so one thing, imagery. Imagery is huge in the field of sports psychology. So how many of you have heard of imagery or know what it is? Okay, awesome. So when we think about imagery, we think about creating an image in our minds. And we might think of that and just kind of practice it on our own, but this is actually really a skill. And we talk a lot in sports psychology that you want to train your mind as much as you train your body. 
So just like every day you go out and you are physically active and you are training your body to learn different techniques, you can do that with mental skills that apply to sport. And so they've done research with Olympic athletes, um, particularly I think it was alpine skiers, and they, through imagery, they were able to isometrically sitting activate the muscles in their body that they use while skiing because they were able to use imagery so well with vividness and activating all five senses which you can do through your brain without having actually actually be there that you're able to have your body in essence practicing without being physically active um, and so imagery is huge uh, we can use imagery to imagine a performance where you were really successful uh, you performed really well, you maybe PR, uh, beat your personal record, and then before a meet or a competition, you have a vivid image in your mind of what that was. You are able to put yourself there, and all of a sudden you are feeling the surge of confidence, feeling the lightness that you felt when you were there through kind of disciplined practice that you would do. So we teach athletes how to really get to this point where they could use imagery to build their confidence, use it before training, use it before competitions. Uh, another, another maybe um, issue we get is uh, athletes who are so anxious, it's presented physiologically. So you get really tense, uh, you feel like you have to get sick or you have to use the bathroom right before you're about to compete. And that can be really inconvenient and also then to be hard to kind of let go of. So something that we might walk them through is called pro progressive muscle relaxation. So um, you guys are familiar with psych majors, classical conditioning. So in general, that's just kind of the pairing of an unconditioned stimulus with an unconditioned, an, an unconditioned stimulus and what will eventually become a conditioned response. Uh, and so essentially what you're doing in progressive muscle relaxation is you are having an athlete tense different muscles in their body and relax. And when they're in a relaxed state, you are saying a cue word, such as calm or relax. And you have them go through all the muscles in their body, starting with really specific of tensing your forehead or tensing your jaw um, or tensing kind of different muscles on your arms. So you have that control to eventually kind of being the whole arm um, or the whole leg. And it's over a series of weeks that you basically do this pairing between uh, kind of your body when you're in a relaxed state and this cue word. So that eventually you get to the point where you can actually be right before a competition, you say the word calm, your body naturally just relaxes because you've conditioned it. You've trained your body to be able to relax when you want it to. Um, and you've, you've done this over time. So this is a very well um, researched um, technique uh, that's really interesting uh, and fun to do um, with athletes. And so if you see a video of it, if you imagine like an athlete sitting in a sheet, sitting in a chair, just tensing or relaxing different muscles, it doesn't look like they're doing that much, but you're really training your body. Um, and I think when you think about you're at the Olympics or you're at a professional level, that there's going to be a lot of things that are anxiety provoking. Being able to instantly relax yourself is going to be really valuable. Um, so these are, you know, things that differentiate athletes who, you know, do it recreationally to those who are really at the elite level, how they get there. Um, another, I guess I'll go over kind of the spotlight metaphor. So I used the example before of an athlete will come in, gosh, I keep losing my focus. Uh, well, we'll say that in school, I, I lose my focus. Uh, you can imagine your focus being like a spotlight. So your focus, you actually never lose it, it just goes somewhere else. So it's just going towards something that you don't want it to go to, uh, whether it's going internal or external or to your competitor next to you or to what you eat for breakfast or how stressful any family event is or things like that. So you never lose your focus. It just goes somewhere else. So with that in mind, you gain a lot more controllability over your focus. You can learn how to specifically kind of train yourself to come back to where you want your focus to be. And with intentionality, think right before a meet, okay, what are my three specific things that I want to be focusing on? Um, really, that can apply to any sport. Um, so we think a lot, a lot about that. Uh, yeah, so I think it's been a lot on this. <laughs> we'll move on to the next one. 
Okay, so my background. Uh, Dr. Krauss did a great introduction uh, to kind of describing me a little bit. So I'll maybe talk a little bit more about my research um, so that you can kind of see how I go from kind of the research to the clinical practice because scientific practitioner model is definitely something that I'm a big advocate for. So I uh, started off at CMC uh, and I actually came in as international relations major. I did not know that I was going to go into psychology. And after taking intro to psych, and this is no joke, I'm not just saying to flatter him, after taking intro to psych with Dr. Krauss, I decided to become a psych major, and he became my uh, advisor. And I worked in his lab, which was an amazing opportunity. It was a time to just get introduced to the area of research in psychology, and at the time we were looking at jury decision making, uh, which I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's evolved to different different areas and similar as well. Um, no, I just do the same stuff. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We'll replicate it, reliability. Um, and so, so anyway, so that was a really phenomenal experience. And I then kind of over time, I, I got some internships over the summer. Uh, I worked at Harvard Medical School for a summer. I applied to an internship there because my interest, again, was in kind of weight stigma, childhood obesity, helping kind of create a more positive image of youth um, who are struggling with health issues. And so, Went to Harvard Medical School in that area, working on that for one summer, and I came across a sports medicine doctor. And he, um, I just happened to get in a conversation with him, and he told me about this field of sports psychology. And I said, well, what is that? That sounds amazing. It combines my two favorite things, sports and psychology. This exists. And so I asked him all about it. I asked, okay, well, how do you get involved in this and all this stuff? He, he didn't really have all the answers. And truthfully, later on looking at it, he was practicing sports psychology as a sports medicine kind of trained, which, and doing some of the mental health stuff, which, which has, has, should over time maybe evolve to including someone who's psychologically trained. But at the time, I didn't know anything about that. And I was just learning about it and got so excited. And he told me about this conference that you can go to called the Association of Applied Sports Psychology. And what it is, is it's one of the biggest conferences um, that exists that's specifically for applied sports psychologists. Um, you'll go there, there will be lectures across all the topics that I listed up here on the board. How to become more mentally tough, how to get your, how to perform, what's it like being a sport consultant at the Olympics and all different things. And so I just went. Um, so as a sophomore at CMC, I went to a conference. Um, I didn't, wasn't doing any research at the time, wasn't presenting it. Uh, and I just went to this conference and as a student, I was completely inspired. Uh, and so then after doing kind of my honors thesis here, I took a year off and actually worked under Dr. Tara Scanlon. She's actually a sports psychologist at um, UCLA, but she doesn't do clinical work, she just does research. Uh, but she's really phenomenal and uh, very well known in the field. And so I worked with her for a year um, and honestly did a lot of coaching with lacrosse at the high school level and did a lot of other things in that area and then applied to University of North Texas um, to work under Dr. Trent Petrie, uh, who I'll describe in a minute. But yeah, so that's, that's honestly how I got involved, and I'll have at the end of this kind of some resources that if you're really interested in the field of sports psychology, where to start. Um, and it's not too late, even if you're a senior or anything like that, you can definitely get involved. I took a year off before I applied to graduate school, and I couldn't be more thankful, because my senior year was my last year of my, uh, playing lacrosse, and doing an honors thesis and all the things you were doing, adding, applying to graduate school and taking the GRE into that seemed impossible at the time. So I, I took a year off to do that. So, uh, so now uh, I am at University of North Texas. I've been there for four years. And uh, so this is a picture of us. There's 13 of us. Uh, we're sport consultants. This is across five years. Um, so typically only one to two individuals are accepted each year. So it is quite competitive um, to get into this kind of program. Because uh, particularly, it's one of the only programs in the country where you are trained in counseling psychology, uh, so to treat the general population in mental health, and then you have this sports psychology elective cluster, where from your first year you are assigned as a sport consultant to work with a D1 athletic team. And it is awesome. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of work. Um, nonetheless, you then, throughout your entire time of graduate school, you are doing 
double the work of anyone else who's not in that elective cluster. So you definitely have to care about what you're doing because uh, you're doing all the training for counseling psychology and on top of that, the sports psychology. So you're in multiple practicums at once, uh, which is a lot to juggle. But I love it. Uh, so Dr. Trent Petrie, he is definitely a very uh, influential person in the field of sports psychology. So I talked about ASP, the Association of Applied Sports Psychology being big. Now you imagine APA, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with that, if at the least, at least the formatting of it. Um, and so APA, they have a division called Division 47. This is Sport and Exercise Psychology. So he was the previous president of that um, for the past two years. Uh, and so he's now, it's now moved on to a, a, a new person, but Dr. Tara Scanlon was also a previous president. And so thinking about kind of within this field, um, these presidents are very important people. Uh, they're usually those who've worked at the, with the professionals, the Olympic level, uh, really have gotten to the very top. So there are people who are very influential in the field of sports psychology. And so some of his research interests um, include kind of psychological consequences of injury, uh, mental toughness, uh, working with athletes with concussions and neuroscience components, uh, body image eating disorders in athletes, really common, uh, and a variety of areas. But that's really how I found this school. Uh, that's how I got involved. The University of North Texas is that when I was applying to graduate schools, I just found professors who were doing research that I found interesting. Because in the end of the day, so when it comes down to they're only taking one or two students, you need to convince a professor that if they take you on, that is the best decision they will be making. Uh, that essentially you want to go into an area of their research because essentially they are choosing you as their one student that they can take on that year and will then have for the next four to five years. Uh, so it's, it is possible, uh, it definitely is, but it's something um, you definitely want to show commitment or have a background in research prior to applying. Um, if you have more questions about that, you can definitely uh, answer. Uh, but overall, one other thing I want to say, so University of North Texas, you may have not heard of it before, but it is bigger than UCLA. So there are 36,000 students there. Uh, so it is a huge university in Texas. And so when you think about, we are the 13 sport consultants assigned to the entire athletic department. Uh, so we are working with all the teams um, that are, would like to have us. So we work with swimming, we work with tennis, we work with softball, golf, track and field, football, basketball, um, a lot of really big sports um, that are very important um, to the university and honestly bring in a lot of um, the school's income. So um, we play a really big role with that. And so I wanted to kind of emphasize that. Okay, so who have I served? Uh, again, Dr. Krauss went over this a little bit, but I'll describe it in a bit more detail. So I started off with tennis um, my first year. Uh, tennis was definitely an interesting experience for me. Um, it was at the D1 level, so all of the athletes who were there were actually recruited from Eastern Europe. Um, so English was their second language. Uh, so that had definitely some uh, but some challenges to it. Uh, and I enjoyed working with it. It was an unbelievable experience. There are eight um, women uh, tennis players who I worked with. Uh, I didn't work with any of them individually, but I did work um, kind of at the more team level, doing, doing different team building activities, uh, working with the coaches, traveling with the team. Uh, and then after that, I actually started uh, working out in the community. Uh, so I spent a year of my practicum going to local high schools and working with coaches on um, how to improve creating a more motivating, positive um, training environment in which they were going to help kind of improve just this enjoyment in youth sports. Uh, and so that was really interesting. Also gave a lot of lectures to parents on how to help them uh, kind of have this positive impact uh, on their athletes um, during this critical time of their lives. And so that was really great because as a sports psychologist, it is a, it's a niche. And so you want to be able to kind of expand that beyond just what you're doing um, kind of at the university, but extend it to the, to the broader community. So that was great. Um, then for the last two years, I've been with track and field. They so went from eight athletes to 80. Um, so that's a lot. Uh, so 80 athletes. Um, there's actually three of us who work with track and field. Uh, I'm the only female, and then we have two other males who work 
work with me and, um, and right now I'm kind of the advanced doctoral student working with them so the lead sport consultant and so it takes takes a lot of time uh, it is a lot about sports psychology particularly with teams is about building relationships uh, how can you get coaches who again have been coaching for 30 plus years to really care what you say <laughs> uh, they're looking at you and I'm in my mid-twenties now and so they're thinking okay what does this person kind of have to say about something that I've been doing for so long and and you can't also guarantee that they're going to win uh, because we can't control those factors either it's, and so it's a lot about building that trust uh, building that alliance with the coaches helping them see the benefits of having you and seeing you as an asset so everything you can do from just showing up to practice. Um, so even though I am no longer a college athlete, I go to practice every week. <laughs> so I go to practice and I am on the track and field for at least five to six hours a week. Uh, just because my presence of being there shows my commitment uh, to them and commitment to seeing what they're going through. Uh, a common saying in track and field is what other sports punishment it is, is our sport. <laughs> so uh, so it, you have quite, um, quite interesting personalities. And with this, across all the different event groups, you definitely have different personalities and different almost minute sport cultures that are happening uh, of those who are throwers versus those who are sprinters. And, um, the cross-country teams and so I'll talk in kind of the next slide about some of my work individually with them uh, But that's been really great. And then last but not least uh, I've worked on what's called a psyching team uh, with marathon uh, runners. How many of you have heard of that or has anyone? Probably not. Okay, so this is really cool. So I myself I'm uh, after I finished um, being at CMC I was used to working out a lot uh, I've been an athlete my whole life and I thought okay what am I going to do even though I'm in a doctoral program and I'm extremely time consuming I have to stay active. So I decided I was going to run a marathon. So I did about four or five half marathons and then last year I ran my first full marathon. And so I started like really applying sports psychology to myself because I was really kind of being disciplined and somehow waking up at 5 in the morning and going for a two-hour run and then going and having a 12-hour day. Don't ask me where I get my energy, I was just really driven. <laughs> uh, and so, but during this process, I realized how much psychology comes into that. And at a, an ASK conference that I went to, I saw that they were developing these things called psyching teams. And it really started actually in Canada um, with a woman called Kate Hayes. She started the first psyching team uh, about a decade ago. Uh, at the Toronto Marathon and it took her a while to just build connections with the marathon director to be willing to have some sport consultants at the marathon. Uh, but what ended up happening is that there was a athlete who almost died and um, they, they were running and had a serious um, kind of physical health issue and the sports psychologist went with the athlete and helped them through that time. And then at that point on, the director was a full advocate of kind of having the psyching team. So they're actually growing all over the US and internationally. And basically what you do is you do hands-on sports psychology while they are running. So you literally go to a marathon where there are hundreds and thousands of people. You have hundreds of people running the race. And then you also have all the fans like lining, lining all the streets that have been shut down by the community. And you have um, a shirt that has psyching team on it. Mm -hmm. And at this, I actually went to, uh, I went to one in Springfield College uh, in Massachusetts. And so we have a presence at the expo. And so uh, at the expo, we have a sign and it was like, what are you running for? What is your running mantra? And so people would come over and we'd help them with their goal setting. We'd help them come up with self-talk, things that when it gets really grueling and hard while they're racing, what are they going to say to themselves to pick themselves back up? What does it mean to hit the wall? This is a common thing in marathon runnings where you have basically um, in your body lactic acid that, that builds up, that all of a sudden your body just goes limp. Um, and you're basically not producing, you don't have enough fuel in your body. Um, at the time and so there's often this fear in marathon runners. Oh, I'm gonna hit the wall Okay, well, how do you approach that fear and we would work with them on how to kind of make it so it by acknowledging the fear and setting goals and different different ways to talk to themselves to help them with Managing that or managing just their anxiety. It's their first marathon 
um, and what are they running for. So that was a phenomenal experience that I had. And I actually, um, so while I was there, I actually, I was running with, um, with a woman. I ended up finishing the race with her and they gave me all of the medals and all this stuff. And I tried to say no, but that they kept thinking that I was being humble. And so uh, I didn't sign up for the race, but apparently I did the Springfield Marathon. Um, and so there was this woman who I saw, she was having um, like cramps and I just came next to her and, and asked her, hey, do you, do you want to run in Buddy? And I basically just talked with her, what are you running for? And she told me all about her family, told me all about her reasons for running. And she thanked me at the end and said, you made this so much better and so much more positive. And so it's really a great area. And I'm, uh, so I went with a fellow um, doctoral student. We were in the Springfield College um, psyching team. And then, uh, and we're trying to bring it to um, Texas. So particularly, I'd love to bring it to the marathon that I ran um, in Fort Worth. So uh, we're in the midst of doing that. We started working on it last year and hopefully we'll bring it this year. And so we train people uh, in, who are masters and honestly people fly in from all over. So if you were interested in participating on the psyching team, uh, when we have it, you, you can come. Uh, that essentially we would come and pick you up from the airport, give you a place to stay and you could participate on our psyching team. Um, and we would train you for that, uh, how to do that. So it's really a way again of community outreach and a way to start applying sports psychology and helping um, the field grow. Okay, so um, what have I done now more specifically at some of my work? Uh, none of these pictures I have of anyone who I worked with individually, um, that is because of just confidentiality to protect their identity, different things, but I'm gonna talk broadly about some of the people who I've worked with. Uh, so I've worked with a lot of individual athletes. Um, they didn't know this, but it just happened that I worked with a lot of the endurance athletes, so those who were doing distance. Um, and so I just, maybe I was just naturally drawn to them because of my own personal interest in it as well. But I worked with um, both men's and women's uh, distance teams a lot of the time. And one big thing that I'm an advocate for uh, at the team level is mindfulness. How many of you have heard of mindfulness? Okay, awesome. Uh, how do you define it? Anyone know? <laughs> I know I'm going into class mode, but okay, I'll, I'll describe it. Um, so basically mindfulness is being in the present moment. Uh, so being very attuned to exactly what's happening um, while you're here. So an example right now would be all of a sudden I tell you, become very attuned to what it's like having your back um, against your seat, your feet on the ground, your arms on your, on your chair, all of a sudden your focus is shifting to something else, shifting to exactly what you're doing in the present moment or to your breath. Uh, and so mindfulness, particularly with kind of endurance athletes, they've shown that at the elite level, those who are more internally aware tend to perform at a higher level um, than those who are externally uh, focused. So when you're thinking you're going on a run, you're training, um, how many of you maybe go for runs and listen to music? Okay, I do too. Um, and the reason you're, you're doing that, you're trying to kind of distract yourself, right? Because it's painful and it's hard and you're pushing through it. Those who get to a really elite level, they won't listen to music because they want to be very attuned to exactly what's happening in their body. Um, rather than not wanting to feel pain, they welcome pain. Um, they see pain as their friend. They see pain as a sign that they're challenging themselves. And so this is a lot of the things that I work with with some of the distance athletes is how to manage pain. Um, how to become more attuned to your body rather than externalizing or kind of putting your spotlight on something that's not going to be as helpful. Because when you think about it, a slight adjustment in the positioning of your arms may not for a recreational athlete make that much of a difference, but that could be a second while you're running. And a second could be the difference between beating your PR and qualifying for the NCAAs or not. Um, so when it comes down to it, these really small adjustments can make a big difference and kind of how tense your body gets when you feel pain. And so being aware of exactly where you feel the pain and what's causing it, and if you're attuned to that, you're gonna perform at a higher level. Uh, so I did, with the whole distance team, I'd wake up at six in the morning, and before they go out and train, and somehow try to keep them awake, <laughs> uh, I would put them through mindfulness. I would, I would teach them how to kind of use their breath and become attuned to their bodies. And then they would report back that, um, that they would use it while they're running to help with their pain, to help with kind of becoming more attuned with their bodies. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more. I'm a huge advocate for it. I'm doing my dissertation in that area. So I'm really excited about it. Um, other things I've worked with athletes on is their self-talk. 
Um, so one thing that I like to use, so self-talk, um, what you say to yourself. Uh, we do that all the time, whether you think you do it or not, you're doing it anyways. Uh, and so what we say to ourselves, and this is really relevant in sports because we'll tell ourselves while we're going, okay, go for it, or push yourself, or we'll, we'll maybe swear at ourselves, we'll do all different things in our self-talk. And so that makes a huge difference um, in your performance. Uh, and so one thing, a metaphor I like to give, so, um, and this I'll just make it relevant to track because that's what I've been working in, is so you get, to, you get to the track, you're about to line up for your race, and you have a backpack on. And in your backpack, you have, you have about six or seven books that each weigh five pounds. Um, if you are telling yourself, I'm not good enough, um, the person next to me looks way faster than me, I don't think I trained hard enough. Uh, I'm going to be exhausted in the next two seconds. You're putting more books in your backpack. And you're about to take off. And not only are you kind of holding yourself down, but you now have this huge weight on your backpack. So when you reframe something to more positive, you are taking a book out of your backpack. Uh, and so you are literally lightening your load. If you tell yourself, I trust my training. I'm confident that I can reach my goal. I believe in myself. You're going to feel lighter, actually physically, and you will perform better, and you will be more relaxed. And so uh, when I would go over this with athletes, um, I would actually bring a backpack and like have them tell me their negative self-talk and like put the books in it and make a really loud noise, and then have them practice reframing it, and then taking them, and have them, I'd actually have them run around whether it was, I did it with tennis, I had them run around the tennis with their backpack on to let them really feel physiologically what the effect of their negative self-talk is going to do. Because imagine, you're, you're just about to serve, and you're gonna say, I'm gonna miss. What, what's gonna happen? You're probably going to miss. Like, think about self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, our our self-talk really, in an instant, it really impacts our performance. Uh, so, so that's some examples of that. Uh, coaches, I've worked, um, since I've been with track and field for a while, um, I've built an amazing relationship with the head coach. Um, there's a head coach, he also works with sprints, uh, and then there's a distance coach, a jump coach, and a throw coach. Uh, we actually go on coaches retreats with them, so I went to a cabin with them uh, at the beginning of summer for a week and basically help them come up with their goals for the season, um, help them come up with leadership training, how they are going to train their leaders and how are they going to help um, their leaders kind of execute their expectations and roles on the team? Uh, I help the coaches come up with a coaching philosophy, help him how to communicate that and get his athletes to really buy into the culture and um, philosophy that he embodies. Uh, and overall, it's trying to help them move to a championship uh, level team. And so it's been an amazing experience. Um, and I can speak more to um, coaches uh, if you're interested. Uh, but also, key important people are athletic trainers. So athletic trainers are your best friends. Uh, when you're first starting off with a team, um, getting time with the head D1 coach is very challenging. So mostly what you're doing is you're talking with the athletic trainers, who's usually five or six to a team, um, particularly of as big a team as this, and you're getting very close with them. You want them to think they're like good friends with them because they're going to be the ones who are for athletes to you because when you think about athletes when they're complaining about things the most when they're struggling with things they're often in the athletic training room uh, and so that's key um, I have built that relationship where I get text messages from the athletic trainer saying hey I have this athlete I'm referring them to you and things like that so athletic trainers are huge in um, helping when you're working with the team so I actually have a short video uh, so we at the Center uh, for Sports Psychology, I actually, um, we created uh, these short films. But I don't know, because I know we started a little bit after. Mm -hmm. Should I should I show it or wait? We, we have about 10 minutes left, so. Okay, then want... I'll just speed through. Uh, you can look at it later if you want. Okay, um, so how do you become a sports psychologist? So basically there are a lot of paths um, to go in, into sports psychology. I did the, psycholo the psychology doctoral training uh, that basically you either need additional competency in sports psychology that you get through a master's before starting the program, or um, in my program, which I think there's like one other in the country, that uh, you get it while you're getting your doctorate. Um, so I I've got my master's um, a year ago, and, um, and I'll be finishing my doctorate in a year. And so then you have the, the title of being a sports psychologist. 
And um, in that though, before I guess you're a psychologist, like in anything, you have to get licensed. Um, so you then have, once you're a licensed psychologist, you have the ability to work with athletes um, with their mental health. Now, you can do other routes. Um, you can do doctoral training. Uh, and so in uh, the field of sports science. And so if you wanted to, and then you could potentially get a master's. Um, and so then you'd be a master's level therapist who could work in sports psychology. But you wouldn't be a sports psychologist. To be a sports psychologist, you have to have a doctoral degree in general psychology and then specialize in sports psychology in some form. Um, in this case, you'd be a certified consultant. So the Association of Applied Sports Psychology Certified Consultant. So you'd be able to, um, and then of course if you go at the master's level, you would be able to work with teams, you'd be able to work with individual athletes, but if they have any mental health concern, if they're struggling with any depression, any, any anxiety that's more clinical, any home issues, stuff like that, you'd have to refer them out. Um, so I personally think that, that an athlete is really a whole person, and so I didn't want to just be working with kind of performance enhancement. I really wanted to be able to help the athlete as a whole, which was why I chose this path. However, you can choose other paths. Um, so yeah. Okay, and my last slide. Uh, so what do you tend to do? Uh, so you can do a lot of things. Um, my hope is I plan to be at a university counseling center. Um, I hope to actually be at Stanford. Um, and, uh, and I'll be applying for that next year, so keep your fingers crossed. Uh, and, but basically, you work in a counseling center and you may see athletes who are sent there um, who go to the counseling center, like you have here at CMC. So, any athlete that would go would maybe go see the sports psychologist there. Or you could actually be housed in the athletic department and they'll be doing kind of what I'm doing now at University of North Texas um, and working with the teams. Uh, you can work in the military, uh, kind of performance enhancement in general doesn't just apply to sports. It actually, pre pre um, whoo, it actually can be applied to a lot of different performance areas, whether that, that's military, whether that's musicians or public speakers, things like that. You can kind of go into it, but then it's not really sports psychology, it's more performance psychology, which is another area. Uh, the United States Olympic Committee, uh, they have eight sports psychologists on staff. So imagine all, so there's like one sports psychologist assigned to all aesthetic sports. So imagine a synchronized swimming, dance, gymnastics, one. <laughs> so we're hoping over time that this is going to expand. They're going to start really realizing that this is going to help them. Um, and that's honestly what our training is designed to do with optimal performance. But there is stigma in the field of sport to the psychological aspect of it, which does likely influence that. Uh, sports medicine clinics. Um, very briefly, so my research area is psychological consequences of injury. So I'm actually going to be doing a mindfulness and imagery based intervention with athletes post ACL surgery. So I'm currently going to sports medicine clinics to recruit for my dissertation. Uh, so I'm working with, I'm hoping like 15 would be an amazing number for my two intervention groups and one control. So I'm trying to get 45 and I have a full year to try to get this, but I'm gonna be putting them through a four month intervention. Uh, one will be mindfulness based, one will be um, imagery based to help with some of the psychological consequences of injury. Uh, or a group practice uh, or a professor and researcher. And yeah, this is, I just wanted to give you guys some resources and I'll be happy to give the Psych Club my presentation. Hopefully it has information that you find helpful. Uh, but basically, UNT Center for Sports Psychology, we have different news, um, different newsletters that we produce that um, they're not all up to date, I can tell you, but really um, valuable information just about uh, sports psychologists working with Olympic athletes, um, stuff related to coaches, athletes, students um, across the board. Uh, and then there's little bios on all of us. You can see a picture of me on there. Uh, follow us on Twitter. We are trying to really expand this. Um, I think we've gotten to like 500 followers, which was our goal for this year. Well, we're really wanting to expand that. So my advisor was wanting me to really push that forward. So follow us on Twitter. Uh, and then more resources. These I really tried to make. You can just also type in online to Google APA Division 47 and you'll find something. But these are specifically likes to resources that are very student friendly. Um, listing books or different area conferences um, that you can look into. And then the Association of Applied Sports Psychology. If you're interested in this, I would really recommend you going. Um, it's in Indianapolis next year. I'll be there. So if you go, you can definitely contact me. Uh, and so it's just a, an amazing way to get involved. 
Um, and you can get involved whether you're a freshman, a senior, or a graduate. So, yeah. So thank you. <laughs> Actually, a psycholo the psychology department has funds to, play to pay for student travel to conference. Mm -hmm. I think you can also apply for other funding as well mm -hmm. to pay for it. So if you're That's interested, uh, the, there's definitely, there are many, many routes to help you uh, get out there. And it's just a great experience to do as an undergrad as well. Yeah, so. for sure. There's a lot of undergrads there. 
Um, so there's a lot of ways to kind of interact with graduate students, and they usually have a graduate student fair um, there, and so then there'll be all these graduate schools where it's the professors who you're wanting to be working with, and you're meeting them even before you're applying to the school, and if that doesn't show commitment, then <laughs> I don't know what does, but it's, it's a really good opportunity. Um, so, yeah, CMC flew me to Canada my senior year. <laughs> it was like right around the Olympics and I was in Canada. I thought this was so cool. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's just, it's amazing opportunities. And I know as a psych major, you're kind of, a lot of the other departments maybe get um, more speakers or things that come in. Like when I, when I was here, at least like economics and um, different sequences, they get, they get a lot of attention. And so still advocate for yourself because as psych majors, you can do a lot. Um, so, <laughs> thank you so much for. Are there any more questions? Well, so you run on the marathon? Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna. I'm doing the summer. I was just gonna do like some triathlons. I think. Um, but Those are awesome. yeah, yeah. I was gonna do a speed triathlon actually the other week, and I started training for it, but then. I got really into my dissertation to try to get that proposed, so then I had to kind of put that on hold for a little bit. But I'm gonna get back into it for sure. Yeah. Definitely. Any other questions, comments? Uh, thank you thank so you. much. And, and really feel free to email me anytime. Like, I, I would be happy. I can't promise you I'll get back to you that day, but sometime that week I'll get back to you. I, I try to get to my emails. But yeah, really just email me any questions. Um, particularly if you're going to be going to a conference, let me know. I'd be happy to grab a coffee or anything with you. Uh, so yeah.